We're going to talk about stroke. Uh, it was interesting to reflect with a colleague from Cincinnati just a moment ago uh, about how much things have changed. Um, in 1973, when I started medical school, yes, 40 years ago, uh, to celebrate, I bought an emergency lunch box off of eBay recently, and I'm 40 years old, you know, I carry it around. In those days, if a guy showed up having an MI to the emergency department in Augusta, Georgia, where I was, we would uh, give him morphine. This was pre-aspirin days, pre-nitro. We would give him oxygen, we would put him to bed, and we would give him digitalis and Lasix if his lungs filled up with fluid, and we would hope that he would not die. Today, an MI is an acute vascular emergency, just as if you transected your popliteal artery, we gotta get that artery open. The same thing applies to ischemic stroke, and there is a lot going on both behind and in front of the scenes as far as what's happening with ischemic stroke these days. Again, I work for Paul, I'm down in Dallas. Here's what folks didn't know until very recently, that in a typical acute ischemic stroke, every minute until reperfusion, the brain loses two million neurons, 14 billion synapses, and 7.5 mile, miles of myelinated fibers. A stroke is a big deal and it is one of the most debilitating illnesses known uh, when someone becomes suddenly hemiplegic and if the problem is not treated and they're committed to a lifetime of uh, nursing care, likely unable to speak, it's a, it's a devastating illness. And our job is to not to let that happen if we can. Despite its effectiveness in improving neurological outcomes, many patients with ischemic stroke are not treated with thrombolysis because they arrive late or because of delays in assessment or, or administration of the medication. The guidelines are clear. In, intravenous RTPA, that's recombinant TPA, thrombolysis, is recommended for selected patients who may be treated within three hours of the onset of ischemic stroke. That's a class one recommendation, level of evidence uh, A. That is the highest recommendation that American Heart and the American Stroke Association can give. TPA should be administered to eligible patients who can be treated in the same time period of three to four and a half hours after the stroke, which means you can take it out from three all the way to four and a half. That's also a class one recommendation. The level of evidence is a little softer for that. The target treatment then with TPA should be within an hour of the patient's arrival in the ED. That's class one. That is the highest level of evidence. Now, I'm going to come back to this in a second, but this is what is happening. There is a major push in this country to make sure that we get the patients to the hospital and in at least 50% of the patients who are presenting with ischemic stroke, at least 50% are treated within an hour. And hospitals that call themselves stroke centers are going to be held absolutely accountable. You don't do it, you don't wear the ticket stroke center and stroke patients who bring in lots of money uh, will no longer be coming to your facility. Indeed, there's Target Stroke, which is a national quality improvement uh, campaign of the American Heart Association designed to improve outcomes for ischemic stroke patients by helping hospitals achieve door-to-needle times of 60 minutes or less. Um, does it make a difference? You bet. Excellent outcome to three months on all scales on the NINDS TPA stroke trial of which Paul Pepe was part of that trial. Th this is the new information. It's the fact that we've now got enough data on our hands after many tens of thousands of patients that we understand that if it's an ischemic, not a hemorrhagic stroke, if it's an ischemic stroke and if you treat them early, the benefit is enormous. But if you treat, and this is zero to 90 minutes, but if you go way out to six hours, it's much more likely that they would be harmed by the use of thrombolysis. So folks in this room, we're all gonna shake hands and kumbaya here and say, we gotta do this. This is what we've gotta do in our, in our systems. Because there's a term called the number needed to treat and if that number is low, that means that the treatment is extremely effective. For every eight patients that are treated with TPA or have an ischemic stroke, the, the outcome is tremendous. And uh, the number needed to treat to just have an improvement is only three. That's huge. That's, that's up there in the range of therapeutic hypothermia post-cardiac arrest. So for every 100 patients treated with TPA, 32 benefit and three are harmed. So the sooner that the TPA is given to ischemic stroke patients, the greater the benefit, especially if it started within 19 minutes of symptom onset. Here's the point. Those of us in this room who are involved in the entire system of care understand that that, uh, that, that 90 minutes has components to it. But what we know is the fact that if, it, if the uh, benefit, I mean, if the, if the thrombolysis has started early, that there's an enormous benefit. This is called odds ratio. That means it's about almost two and a half times the likelihood the patient's gonna do well. And that odds ratio approaches uh, no improvement at all out at about five to six hours. 
So time is brain. Stroke onset to IVTPA less than or equal to three hours or less than or equal to four and a half hours. Door to IVTPA goal. This is it, folks. This is new. Just announced six weeks ago by the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Hospitals that this is the standard to which hospitals are, are going to compare. How are they doing? Terrible. Uh, this is hospital variation in the proportion of ischemic stroke patients treated within an hour. And what you find is at the top of the bell curve is that only 10 to 20% 10 to of hospitals are actually achieving this. So it's not happening yet, and yet this is an acute vascular emergency. So we want to achieve a door-to-needle time within 60 minutes in at least 50% of patients who are victims of ischemic stroke. Uh, providing TPA with a short door-to-needle time reflects a complex clinical process requiring coordination across departments and disciplines to affect timely triage, diagnosis, decision-making, and treatment of a critically ill acute ischemic stroke patient. It requires a well-organized team approach, and that's essential for the implementation of timely acute ischemic care. Um, early identification, activation of the stroke team, evidence-based, readily accessible, effective protocols, rapid ordering and acquisition and interpreting of, of the brain imaging, accurate and rapid physician orders, re reliable I IV TPA administration, coordinated patient mon monitoring, ongoing assessment, and accurate time logs for tracking and timely data feedback. We have to organize a stroke team with a focused goal to improve the portion of eligible stroke victims receiving IV TPA uh, in the door to needle time of less than or equal to 60 minutes. The American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association have put out customizable, implementable tools that include time trackers, uh, guideline algorithms, TPA checklists, and so forth. Uh, this talk, by the way, is also on my website. I'm, I'm in the back of the room doing HTML coding to try to figure, it's been a long time since I've done that, trying to figure out to, to make sure I can put all these things out there for you. So this is what should happen. Uh, patient rolls into the door to the doc 10 minutes or less. To the ED physician, the, the decision made in less than 15 minutes. CT scan and stroke neurology consult, less than 20 minutes and then treatment decision and initiate IV TPA, 10 plus 15 plus 20 plus 15 equals 60 minutes. Now here is the point that is so important. Advanced hospital notification by EMS is critical. I've got every stroke center in town and we've got the, we have uh, the 15 hospitals, 13 are stroke centers or are about to become stroke centers. And all of them are beating up on me for the EMS system to say we've got to have pre-notification. EMS providers should provide early notification to the receiving hospital when a patient with stroke-like symptoms is recognized in the field. Advanced notification of the patient arrival by EMS can shorten the time to imaging and improve the timeliness of treatment with thrombolysis. Indeed, the stroke team, uh, what they're telling me, will be standing by upon the arrival uh, of the EMS uh, 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 folks. Uh, rapid triage protocol and stroke team notification. Uh, and the part that I uh, emphasized here is after notification from the pre-hospital personnel. Single call activation system, this whole thing should roll out very quickly. When you call, they haul. And so as part of the target stroke initiative, quantitative studies are planned to determine the, the degree to which each of the best practice strategies are, are effective. Uh, so we got to go from here to here, door to needle within 60 minutes, and the participation by EMS is critical. Standardize the stroke assessment. Is it Cincinnati? Is it Los Angeles? Uh, Paul and I back in 01 made up the PEPI scale uh, versus the NIH stroke scale. And folks, focus here. You've had a long day. You've got to get the last known normal time. They've got to know that. So your teams that are working for you have got to make sure that if they can find out when Aunt Minnie was last right and now she's not right, that, that, and you get that and you relay that over the radio to the hospital working closely with the hospital teams, and then got to get CQI feedback back to the EMS teams. That's critical. Uh, some states don't provide for that. Texas has a wonderful statute. If you contact me, I'll, I'll give it to you, that, uh, re that requires receiving facilities to give uh, outcome data to the transporting agencies for the purpose of quality control. The thing is, we can't expect medics to do this here. This is an NIH stroke scale. This is a monster. We, we cannot expect them to do that. The Cincinnati is about as good as it is. It's the FAST exam. Uh, is, there, is there a facial droop? Uh, is there arm drift? Is there abnormal speech? Uh, so that's what we do uh, down in Dallas. So through such preparations and implementation, the care of the stroke patient can be optimized, decreasing morbidity and mortality in one of the most vital areas of healthcare. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good. Yeah, yeah, actually.
you know how you know you're getting old, right? Oh, no, I didn't know you, that. You, you come home and tell your spouse or partner or whomever, honey, uh, I'm, I'm having an affair at the office. And he or she goes, really? Who's catering? Okay. All right, sorry, bad joke. So you guys have to take an insurance policy off. You have to hear my bad joke again. You can file a claim for damages. So we're still. All right, so moving on um, uh, is our next in uh, introductee, okay, is uh, Clement Yeh. Clement started off with. Uh, San Francisco Fire Department a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of uh, years ago, has done a fantastic job. He's uh, one of the faculty at the University of California in San Francisco, works at their trauma center, supervising residents and so on. And, uh, stepped into the breach a couple of years ago when Carl moved over to Alameda County and uh, didn't know what he was getting into, right? Had, uh, had no warning. Been, but he's been terrific. And so now they're looking at how they're doing, they're doing getting into some of these cool things where they're looking at their data and analyzing how they're making their responses, and I think it'll be self-evident as we go through this. So uh, with uh, the caveats I gave you before, I'm gonna have uh, Clement Ye from uh, the Medical Director for San Francisco uh, come in and uh, give you the, the when, where, who, and what, okay? Thanks a lot. Well, Thank please you. welcome from San Francisco, Clement Ye. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pepe. Um, so uh, the title of this talk is When, Where, Who, and What, uh, but before we get there, I thought I would just start off with, uh, with why. Um, and I, I want to go back to something that, uh, that I heard a few days ago from John Morse, who I believe is one of the, the state senators here. Um, and he said, I, I can't exactly paraphrase it, but if you're putting your, your life on the line to do your job and, and defend public safety, we have a certain obligation to make sure that you have the tools to do that in the most effective manner, in a safe manner, so you can continue on to carry out the mission. Uh, and in this respect, uh, I think I want to frame this discussion about system design because I think this has a lot to do with getting the right treatment to the, to the right patient at the right time and also doing so in, the, in a manner that is safest for our members and making sure that we can carry on and take care of ourselves and our families, okay? So um, I'm going to talk a lot about um, sort of system design and, and, and triage and response patterns here, but raise your hand if you think that your system's response pattern is just right. <laughs> All right, that was an easy one. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, of course. The medical director says yes. Good one, good one, nice. Um, how many of you feel that you, you over-respond to minor complaints? Okay, all right, everybody, pretty much. How many feel like you, uh, you under-triage some of the major complaints? All right, good, there are a couple. I mean, and, and I think that there's certainly aspects of all systems that meet all of those um, types of things. Depends on who you ask, right, Dave? <laughs> so let's look at a survey of um, among Eagles participants about red lights and sirens use. Uh, so sort of the highest level and, and um, what, what we in San Francisco call code three responses. So you, as you can see across the country, there really um, is a diversity of uh, responses. Um, some communities have respond to all of their medical emergencies with red lights and sirens. And then there are, you know, there's one community that's very aggressive about decreasing their red lights and sirens use. The most, most of the rest of us are kind of in the middle here between 50 and, and 90%. Um, and so, you know, why, why is this an issue? I mean, we're going we're gonna to kind of go, go back to the, uh, the other points here in just a second, but um, sort of back up in history, uh, the National Association of EMS Physicians in 1994, um, I believe this might have been under Dr. Fowler's uh, tyr tyrannical rule, um, they uh, uh, established a physician paper on the use of warning lights and sirens in emergency medical vehicle transport and patient transport. Um, excuse me, did I read that right? Something like that. Um, but the issue is this, and I, I think um, it, it's probably one that, that you are all very familiar with, which is that um, there are risks and benefits to everything. And we want to ensure, and all of us, I believe, want to ensure that we're getting the right treatments to the right patients um, with what, we, what is the right risk-benefit uh, ratio, okay? And this is the actual language of the NAMSP um, P physician paper, but to sum summarize, uh, you know, the, the punishment should, should suit the crime, right? So we should have some forethought that goes into what our patients need uh, and design our system and our response patterns in a, in a fashion uh, to meet those needs. Um, and I also want to kind of back this up and, and acknowledge that um, system design is not everything about, uh, about uh, rescuer safety. Obviously, this is a multifactorial uh, discussion, has everything to do with vehicle safety, training, public education. Um, but I think that 
Uh, if you haven't done so before in your community, I, I highly recommend you look at what your response patterns are because this is another aspect that we might be able to meet that first challenge that I met, mentioned, which is to make sure that we have the adequate tools to do the right thing um, and, and ensure the safety of all of our members, okay? So is this a medical device? I would argue it is. So we know that uh, one of the most important things that we provide to our patients uh, in certain cases is diesel therapy, right? We get people, uh, whether it be an acute stroke uh, or other traumatic conditions, for example, uh, we need to get people to a definitive care as soon as possible. But is there a benefit to rapid transport? Of course there is. There's also a risk. Um, and this is not a new risk to many of you, and I, I, I'm sure people in this room probably personally have experience with this, um, but there is risk associated with red lights and sirens operations, both to the public, uh, the patients, and also to all of our rescuers. Um, there are a lot of examples of uh, ways in which various systems have used the data uh, to look back at their dispatch protocols and try to refine and bend that risk-benefit ratio uh, favorably. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what our experience was in San Francisco uh, and challenge you to, to uh, look at the pieces that, that potentially could be useful for you in your own um, home, home areas. So does RLS response save time? Yes, it does. Is it clinically significant? Um, that depends. So some studies have shown that in rural areas, if you respond hot with lights and sirens, you may gain about three minutes or so on average. Uh, in urban areas, as you might expect, the time savings is less, minute and 46 seconds. And, and we studied it in San Francisco, it was about a minute and 52 seconds. And the 25th and 75th percentiles in that data was, went from about 90 seconds to about three minutes, okay? So is that clinically significant? Obviously, you know, we can think of cases in which three minutes or 90 seconds is, is clinically significant. But let's contrast that uh, with what our hospital timelines are, all right? Any of you who've been in the hospital recently know that you're in a whole nother time warp. Um, and uh, our average length of stay nationwide for admitted patients is 269 minutes. And for patients that eventually go home is 156 minutes. Now, what is not factored into this um, is the time to intervention. All right, so I'm sort of framing this in terms of risks and benefits again. So let's talk, go back to risks. In terms of emergency response, is RLS response riskier? We all know that it is. In fact, the majority of fatal collisions occur with uh, emergency operations and red lights and sirens operations are more likely to result in injury. As I mentioned, just a little bit ago, this is a multifactorial issue. Obviously, the solutions exist on a lot of different levels, everything from public education, uh, vehicle design, operator training, um, and I believe system design is an important part of, part of this as well, okay? So what do you need to know in your community? I think it's important to understand what the time gained, the, the actual time that you might gain from an RLS response. You need to understand what the epidemiology of uh, your 911 complaints are. And then I also think that it's important to, to getting back to that entire question of when do people get those critical interventions, uh, it's important to understand how often people are getting time sensitive um, uh, ALS or BLS uh, interventions for that matter. All right, so let me go back to sort of a case study in San Francisco. Um, San Francisco, we have a nighttime population, about 800,000, very compact city, 47 square miles. We do almost 100,000 medical responses with uh, 42 ALS engines and 25 single medic ambulances. We went back and looked at about 8,000 calls, so about 15% uh, of our Code 3 dispatch volume, uh, looked at 50 different uh, MPDS, which is our, you know, the medical priority dispatch system. Many of you may, may be familiar with this, but we looked at 50 different call types, uh, specific call types, looked at the electronic patient care records and hospital outcomes, and then looked at rates of time-sensitive ALS interventions, which we defined as things such as CPR, defibrillation, advanced airways. From that, we came up with a list and uh, some candidates of call types that had very, very, very low rates of ALS interventions and had very, very, very low rates of emergent transfer to the hospital, okay? Uh, and from that, we came up with a proposed change with a goal of decreasing our red lights and sirens use by about 10%. Um, and then in this change, we tracked code two dispatch and code three return rates. We also looked at hospital outcomes and interventions uh, from our electronic patient care records. 
So just to give you an example of some of the proposed changes, um, these are, are, are complaints that I'm sure you all are very familiar with. Abdominal pain, um, headaches, young people with heart problems, um, the general sick person uh, that is uh, so common in, in most systems. And my, my favorite is the uh, interfacility transfer. You know, why were we responding hot to hospitals and clinics um, and uh, where there are medical personnel, some people who, have, even with their advanced capabilities, why are we putting people at risk to get apparatus there if it's just to move them somewhere else, okay? So we also, these were, these were our candidates for um, downgrade, and then we also had a number of, of call types that, although they had low rates of ALS time-sensitive interventions and low rates of emergency transfer back to the hospital, we felt that you know, should patients deteriorate, we wanted to have resources moving in the right direction so we could upgrade if necessary. Those included assaults, types of falls, heart problems, bleedings and bleeding uh, cases, and then the ever popular unknown problem. This is the sort of the cell phone Samaritan cases where there's someone down, I'm driving by, I'm heading the direction, go get them, right? So um, what we found in our system was that, as I mentioned, we, we had a goal of, of decreasing our red lights and sirens use by about 10%. We actually came up with about 12% decrease uh, of our code three traffic. Um, interestingly, our code three return rate did not change. In fact, it went down a little bit. Um, and uh, uh, furthermore, looking at the characteristics of our cases in which there was a, a, a code two dispatch and a code three return to the hospital, uh, we found that many times people were making these, these time intervals anyway. Half of the time they were on scene uh, in uh, less than seven minutes. Three quarters of the time they were on scene in less than 10 minutes, okay? And I think this has something, has a, quite a lot to do with the geography and our system uh, specifically, but these were important considerations when we were sort of tracking how these changes went. So future, future directions for this project. Obviously we're, we're continuing to analyze our data and continuing to make refinement, refinements. I sort of think of our response pattern, this is not, these aren't the tablets that kind of came down from the mountain. These are, these are constant works in progress that we need to use our best available data to have the most efficient response pattern to optimize that risk benefit ratio. Um, we're also undergoing a computer aided dispatch upgrade, which and if you, any of you have gone through that recently, know that's akin to passing a kidney stone. <laughs> um, we're looking to incorporate metrics such as a rapid uh, acute physiology score, which uses actual biometric um, data from the patients about their vital signs to predict how sick they may be. And then sort of the ultimate goal and, and the uh, sort of dream package of this would be linking all of this to hospital outcomes and patient outcomes in the hospital so we can feed back to the system and be able to have a constantly upgraded dynamic response pattern that has the latest data about where, where, where we can get to uh, patients and get them the most need or get them the most benefit for uh, the, the least amount of risk, okay? So in summary, I would challenge you to consider ALS and BLS response, for that matter, in, in your communities as a therapy. Um, ask your medical directors, why are we responding in this way to these types of calls? What kind of data is this based on? And if you don't know, uh, and if they can't answer that question, start asking those questions. Where can we get this information? Who do we need to talk to? What kind of collaborations do we need to get this together? Have some frank discussions in your community about what your expectations and standards should be and then when you can get all that together, it's a matter of optimizing that balance. Um, because what's at stake here is really uh, very large. It's not only our patient's care, it's not only making sure that we get timely interventions, but it's also uh, the, the, the health and safety of all of our rescuers and operators out there in the system, okay? Thank you very much. Um, you know, interestingly, uh, the, the response time, excuse me, oh, that's okay. so uh, yes, so this, let me just say yes, so, so this is not something that was hatched overnight, um, this, we went through a very extensive process of vetting through the system, um, shopping these changes around, uh, making sure everyone was aware uh, that these types of proposed changes were happening, um, and I frame it really in, this, in, the, in the lens of patient care and safety. Um, and in that, in that respect, that was not difficult to do. Um, now, this is, this is uh, different because, uh, in a sense, we are not 
changing the response times for those high acuity calls. We are saying some of these calls are not high acuity. All right, so that's a very, it's, it's, it's a very small nuance, but I think it addresses some of the, the, the political considerations to that. Yeah, you know, I, I think, um, I, I understand where you're, that's a very good point, uh, that's a very good question, and I think that sort of brings um, one of my, my points about wanting to have a better linkage with the hospital, because that is really where the benefits are the greatest, and I think we have to do a better job of communicating with our hospital partners about how important it is that we have these interventions, and that we're getting to the right patients and doing the right thing for them, because it impacts their, their quality metrics. Um, and that, I think, speaks to that interface that we have to have, perhaps with your medical directors, perhaps to all of you, just engaging the hospitals. Yes, sir. I absolutely can, can make that available to, uh, to Dr. Fowler um, and through the Eagles group, and, and we'll make that available to all of you. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, preemptors? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure that that terminology is not uh, common in our system. He just started an EMS a yeah. couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the ability to change the, the light. The oh, I see, I see, I see. Uh, that was not that was not a factor in, in our in our studies or our system change. Yeah. yeah. Do your dispatch centers use dispatch protocols, right? Yes, they do. So uh, that's a very good question, uh, and so we have, our, our dispatch center, we have a, a single combined emergency communication center that uses uh, the uh, medical priority dispatch system, which is, uh, some people know as the Clawson system, um, and uh, part of that is, uh, an important component of that, and I believe an important component of this change was emphasizing those pre-arrival instructions uh, for people who are activating 911 so that if there is an immediate life-saving intervention, and a, and a caller can undertake those, they can initiate those um, and, and perhaps, you know, save a few seconds off that clock. Okay, all right, thank you all. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, so, so this, is a bit, this is a very different, and this is, this is um, how you frame that question is, I think, a very important point. And I think the difference, as I mentioned in response to the other uh, gentleman's question, we were really not saying it's okay for a high acuity call to take longer. We're saying some of these calls are not high acuity calls. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, what, Understood, and, and but I think that you you know the, the challenge is really using your data to, to, to ask that question. Yeah, I mean Dave and I been through this, and we, we actually studied it before we made changes, and it's really highly predictive. You really can't do, and, and in the cases where it turns out that there's scrubs, you aren't going to change the outcome anyway when we've done it. So Dave's done a really good job of continuing. The reason why he says I'm satisfied by the system because he has a, a, a whole organization that continues to fine tune. far as the, we've had debates about the, the role actually here in our group on, on several of the things and uh, we can have that part of the discussion. Maybe we'll at least bring that up later. Uh, like Ray Fowler has been part of that, just you know, debates about you know, the, the responses amongst other people. So we can probably talk about that in more detail later. Okay. All right. So why don't we cover that in, in the, the further session? Okay. Sure, no, that's, well, okay. One more. One more. No, not you though. The person in the back. <laughs> we'll come back to you when we come to right. the other session. You're from Los Angeles. Can't Okay, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah, go ahead, the person in the back. 
That is a very good question. So um, this is a, uh, what, I, what I tell both our dispatchers, um, our engine medics, our paramedics is if you see something um, that you don't like and you feel like you need to exert your clinical judgment, I want to empower you to do that. You must be able to act um, for, for patient safety. However, I need to know about that because if there is a case uh, where there is a mismatch, we need to fix that as soon as possible so that the system doesn't require that you catch it every single time. So if you, if you exert authority, you must accept responsibility. And part of that is having a discussion with me and making sure that, that we, if there are changes that need to be made, they, they can be made uh, effectively. All right. So the answer to that is yes. I want to empower people in our system. Um, but the caveat is that it cannot be done uh, in isolation. So if you have a briefing, you know, the, uh, from the Los Angeles, if you do have a brief question, go ahead. You mean so uh, um, in, in my discussions with with, um, with Jeff Lawson as well as with uh, Party Dispatch, you know they they allow uh, local jurisdictions to determine what your response pattern is. Um, classically, you know we are looking at a lot of these Charlie and Delta calls that classically are highest level um, ALS calls, and then we are adjusting them uh, based on our own local data uh, and our own community standards to what we feel are are, are, are more effective responses. So uh, th I don't believe that there has been any, um, you know, uh, need for declassification, if you will, in that. But it's an ongoing discussion, and, and I've been, f been sharing data with, with Prior Dispatch about this. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. So, uh, and we'll have more discussions from the group. I'll get some back from the other sessions. But when you actually have the whole forty, you can come up on stage and ask them questions because uh, you know they. Uh, and actually, a lot of times, some everybody's following a study that was done somewhere. And when you get to the person who did this, and they said, actually, their study was crap. <laughs> you know, I don't believe it. And it's, it's kind of interesting when you actually have that kind of exposure to all those who are thinking. Now, uh, for something that's totally like not irreverent, right? <laughs> so, you know, are our our paramedics elemental or detrimental? Uh, so, which is an interesting question. You know, and you'll see what we mean by that as we go through this talk. So, again, you go back to the discussion about, um, uh, about the all ALS system versus uh, other approaches to things. We did a little bit of a drill down in some uh, experiences that uh, Drew Harrell had from the Albuquerque Fire Department system in their, their county. So with that, please welcome back again from uh, Albuquerque, Drew Harrell. Thank you, Dr. Pepe. All right, so uh, as you see here, uh, elemental or detrimental are more paramedics uh, either. And we're, we're in the process in, process in Albuquerque in terms of evaluating our, our response configurations. And we'll kind of walk you through what we've been able to learn thus far. It's an ongoing process. It is not complete. Um, just a very quick background, uh, City of Albuquerque, I've got about 700 uniform members, 220 of which are in an ALS division. Um, we have 182 square miles of response area, almost a million, just short of it, 900,000 for a population. Last year, 81,000 total calls from service, give or take, uh, within that first 100. Um, more than 80% of them are EMS specific, as coded out by the MPDS codes. Um, and I've broken them down. I think what is uh, very important to kind of realize there is, those are the codes, the deltas and the echoes, 20% of our, in essence, 70,000 calls um, got coded out as a delta and echo, and that's only 20%, so one out of every five. Um, get just above a third if you throw in all of the Charlie calls that go along with that. And so following on the heels of Clement and everything, you really kind of identify no more than about a third of our MPDS coded calls are actually, even if you throw in the Charlie calls, ALS calls per se, and then I haven't been able to drill down to the data to tell you out of how many of those calls did we actually have an ALS intervention. I will tell you at a, off of a very small subset of those. Um, we looked at some 17s and some other calls. Um, very, very small amounts of ALS interventions, whether it's a medication or an intervention, stuff like that. So we're looking at ways of how can we better utilize it. We're ALS fire-based first response. We do not transport uh, outside of city employees on duty uh, as well as uh, exceeding the transport capabilities of our partner agency. I've got 22 stations, 19 ALS rescues, two-person paramedic rescues. All of our engines present are BLS. Now, we do have ALS providers that are on them, but depending on uh, staffing, that might be the case that they're all BLS, but they are not staffed from or supplied equipment from a BL an ALS standpoint. Seven ladders, three squads, one of which is there, and then each of our three battalions, we have four battalion chief officers and one paramedic QA per battalion. 
uh, which if you do an interesting uh, span of control organizational chart, um, one apparatus is responsible for every frontline provider as well as piece of equipment in our system from the EMS side. Perhaps maybe a better utilization of some resources could be looked at there. But that's neither here nor there. Um, we're a dual response because we do have an ALS transport agency that provides our transport capability. Uh, through Albuquerque Ambulance, we have a contracted agreement with them. So what is the EMS norm? Uh, and interestingly enough, like politics, it appears to be all local. And uh, there was an Eagle survey that just serendipitously came out as well uh, as I was preparing for this. Um, and I, I think it was Peter Talak uh, in Utah that was asking for what is your EMS ALS response configuration going to the scene and going to the hospital if you do transport? The answers were everywhere, all over the place. And this is just, I broke it down here. So there was two paramedics. There's a paramedic and a basic or an inter intermediate. There's a two paramedics on ALS calls without a good definition of what an ALS call is. There's one or two paramedics and three or four EMTs on ALS engine companies. Uh, there's two paramedics and an EMT. There was a paramedic quick response vehicle that could supplement. Um, there were two paramedics and two EMTs on ambulances. That's a, you'd run out of room really quickly. And even uh, in some areas, there were as many as four to six paramedics and maybe two to four EMTs on some nine echoes. Like, that's a huge response. And layered on top of that, obviously, I think a lady from Indianapolis brought this up, you know, NFA, in, uh, the 1710 response 53334, the ALS response is those two paramedics and two basics is the recommendation from the EMS operations if you look through the 1710 guidelines. So does that help us? Um, I, I really think that it does not because when you have, you know, 80, I mean, 80 million people and the medical directors for a huge section as well as 1710 documentation about response recommendations and what we're doing, there's certainly no standardized approach. So from an ALS expansion goal for us in Albuquerque, um, Kind of the broad 30,000 foot overview is, you know, I think the goal for us um, is engines and rescues to all be ALS staffed. Uh, better utilize and distribute our paramedic pool in whatever way it kind of works uh, locally, and I'll get to that. The most important part, and this is why it's in red, and we will touch on this at the end, is the knowledge, the ALS knowledge on the call. It is by no means, way, shape, or form um, a, a hit against the basic provisions of care that occur for the vast majority of calls. But where we end up in problems, I know within my system from refusal standpoints is where there's just that kind of that lack of oversight on some calls from an ALS perspective. It's not that we need the intervention. Don't hang your hats on ALS interventions moving forward in pre-hospital medicine or we will be without jobs. It's the knowledge that well-trained, appropriate response uh, ALS providers can bring to the scene that makes a difference. And for us, um, ALS redundancy within each response district, because if I can increase the number of ALS uh, apparatus available, the next call within that same fire district does not bring in that, that domino effect of bringing out of district resources in and then exposing other coverage gaps that develop as you continue to move uh, apparatus around. And uh, you know, the absolute and most important thing too is the best care to our customers, which is really the public. So what it is not is saying that our system needs fewer medics. I'm gonna say that again, with bold and caps lock. Not saying that we need fewer medics because the last thing I wanna end up with when I go back home is being outside of the circle of trust. And I think y'all can appreciate that. We are very aware of our, of our audience. Um, we have, if you will, I like to equate it to Goldilocks right now in Albuquerque when I run the numbers. We're just right when you look at cardiac arrest data. And I think that there is a sweet spot, there was a study um, uh, academic Emergency Medicine, Dr. Sayer and his colleagues looked at, there's a percentage survival to discharge with a sweet spot when you have a certain number of paramedics exposure per year to cardiac arrest. And it's quite dramatic, you'll see there on the screen. So 5% survival if you're about one a year, 2.26, which is not a very large change, but you dramatically improve by an order of magnitude, 30% survival to discharge in out of hospital cardiac arrest starts to fall off a little bit, kind of like the sweet spot with CPR and what your rate is. Um, as you actually you get farther out, more of them, for whatever reason, tends to decline it. And right now, when I worked out our numbers for Albuquerque for 2012, out of the six or 700 cardiac arrests, we're at about 3.04, which I'm gonna call is just right, if you're looking at cardiac arrest data. But we get this question a lot. We need more docs on scene. We need more medics on scene, doc. We, need, we get more things done quicker with fewer errors. We're sure about that? What's the data say? 
And actually, if you look at um, some of the data that's out there, so ambulance crews with one paramedic provider, uh, do they have longer scene times than paramedic um, crews with two? Uh, this was the Emergency Medicine Journal back in uh, 2002. About 1,500 mixed, uh, I mean, critical cases with a mixed crew and an AL, all ALS crew. There was uh, a significant difference, right? Shorter times with the, with the mixed crews. There were obviously more interventions with the ALS crews. Now, similarly to the minute or so that you might say from a red lights and sirens response, is that clinically significant? Perhaps, but it's not an impediment to saying that you can use an ALS provider and a BLS provider on a crew because it's going to take longer to get things done. Um, also, what about uh, crew configurations on cardiac arrest? Because really, you know, the time intensive things. Why do we drive fast in big red fire trucks? Because stuff's on fire, which I want you to get to my house quick if something's on fire. If my heart stops beating, I would like for you there as well because to be able to be that pig that gets the dance on Paul's slide, you need to get there within a certain amount of time. Maybe not as quick as we think now. But when you broke it down here, um, Dr. Slovis and all of his folks in Vanderbilt, so two groups, uh, paramedic, paramedic, and a paramedic basic. Interestingly enough, the two paramedic groups had more errors, and they weren't any quicker with interventions except intubation, because, right, intubation saves lives in cardiac arrest. Um, that was the only difference. Across the board, though, the, um, the compression fraction actually was the same, but this might actually lend a little bit more to it. So I oftentimes feel like I'm trying to squeeze this square peg into this round hole, and all I think that is worth the discussion point is that how we do this is the sticky wicket, okay? Um, each system is really going to determine what works best for itself, whether it's you create uh, a single ALS resource or whether you're going to maintain a two ALS provider resource and, and build in another ALS engine component. But the most important thing is to use your patient outcomes and your data to drive those decisions as best as you can. Now, I appreciate the fact that labor and management works out the details, who gets what seat and who goes to where, and I oftentimes get lost in the details because I got more than enough on my plate to not involve myself with that. But that is something that intimately, from the medical director's perspective, we at least need to have some input into what's the data, what's the outcomes, and at least have that discussion. We might not always be exactly where in line with what the end result is, but at least having that discussion is very important because if you can better utilize your pool, you can better distribute your resources, the knowledge of our ALS providers is what moving forward we will be able to use as protection for the jobs and for our members because that is what you bring to the scene, not skills. If you hang your hat on skills, we're gonna find ourselves kind of in the ways of mass pants and big intracardiac empty needles is looking for something to do. Um, building the redundancy for us is a big thing because we have a large surface, we have a large service area for our resources at 182 square miles. We're split by the Rio Grande uh, River running down and we only have five ways to get across it. So if I start affecting ALS resources in a district that are on the outskirts of the city, um, I'm starting to really affect our next response for an ALS request of apparatus in that same district if I only have one. And always, always, always using the data, using the science, using what you try and do in terms of your system development to make sure that we're providing the best care to our customers because the public is who we're there to serve. And always, always maintain your situational awareness because you never know what's happening next to you in the room in the cafeteria when you eat lunch. Thank you very much. And that is, that is an actual picture. I took that in my hospital one day, walking back to the emergency department, which made me quit eating in the cafeteria at the University of New Mexico Hospital. I did rectify the problem. Oh, any questions? I told you there is that insurance policy. All right, any questions? Go ahead. So that is a great question. So in a perfect world, I don't, I, I, you, I, you know, Dave might actually have that be able to to drill out and to drill down to that data. It is difficult for me to write now. Um, we've transitioned over to the Zoll EPCR. We're about eight months into it. Um, as you span multiple different electronic data records and trying to extrapolate data, it's very difficult for me to write now to get down to specific providers because I can, yes, I can guarantee you that if I looked at each individual provider, can I say that each of them were involved with 3.04 cardiac arrests over the last 12 months? Um, I can, we even without Going back and looking at that, I can say no, because I know that there are stations that have run more and stations that have run less. 
That data for, for me right now reported for 2012 is aggregate data. Our totals just divided by, um, by my total medics. Uh, yes, or making sure that we run simulations. Who's the King County guys? And, and I know that up in, uh, up in the Northwest, whoo, yeah. um, up in the Northwest, right, if you don't meet certain requirements per quarter, what are y'all doing? Like, if you don't meet your, your requisite number of innovations, right, places where you've identified you need to make sure that you're meeting your goals in terms of uh, how many cases you're seeing, going back and doing that either in real time, if it's an incubation, for instance, doing it on a quarterly basis in the OR, or, um, or even moving toward simulation, system and as a entity making sure that we identify and those individuals that need not that remediation they just need that practice and that's what it comes down to Can't use it. No, more work on the CPU, I think, uh, to the that yeah so back to your first question about the number of medics and how many arrests they've had per year so uh, we've got we're looking right now in fact I just got the first look at it we're looking at about eight years worth of cardiac arrest data in Houston and uh, we're, we're doing a multi uh, a multifactorial logistic regression analysis and uh, what that means is we find that we've got these huge fluctuations in our ROSC rates and we can't seem to figure out what causes those. Is it when you get new medics coming out of school? Is it seasonal, when vacation, deer season? What is the, because when you look at it from year to year, they don't match, but they're, some of them are pretty big. And so we're going back, we're looking at all this data and uh, as we're going through it, it's kind of like peeling layers off of an onion. But the first thing that popped out was the level of experience of the medical, of the, the medics in terms of not years of being a paramedic, but how many cardiac arrests they've been on over the preceding number of years. And of course, you've got multiple medics on scene. And so we're coming up with a way now where they, or our statistician come up with a way to sort of like uh, put a, uh, a, a way of sort of like, what is the cumulative experience of all those members on that team? And what is, who had the most and how much was it more than the rest? Like, is it a widespread or is it a narrow spread? And so we're just getting, but there is clearly a correlation between the number of medics or the, ex the experience of the medics on the scene of a cardiac arrest and the chances of survival for that patient. So give us about a year to further tease this out because it's, it's um, and we'll be getting other things as well, but there is clearly a correlation there. And, uh, but we're just starting to scratch the surface on that. Okay, thanks a lot, David. I really appreciate that. So I'm ready to move on to our next talk and that'd be great. So we're gonna do a little bit of switching here as we talk a little about deployment strategies and so on. Well, we're gonna take deployment strategies to a whole new level and talking about experiences of the medics to a whole new level. And uh, we start looking into what we think is gonna be the future of healthcare. And then we're gonna be right in the center of it, we think. And a lot of systems, the fire departments in particular, are now starting to get really interested in this. And it didn't start off necessarily as a fire department uh, project in many cities, but the, you're gonna see that the uh, concept that we're gonna talk about the concept of what we, what we have labeled mobile integrated healthcare. Uh, and we'll explain a little bit why we came to that conclusion. So with that, uh, take a great lead on this area. He's done a good job already in learning about this and starting to get things going in his own area is Eric Beck from uh, Chicago Fire Department. So with that, welcome, Eric. So uh, quick show of hands, how many people have heard of community paramedicine? Right, it's all over the program this year. How many people are actively engaged in some kind of exploratory pilot? How many people are getting paid? So. Just for the record, no one is getting paid for these services. So I'm going to uh, start with a, a, a food for thought and challenge you all to suspend what you've learned about community paramedicine for a few minutes and think about what could be. And this builds on themes you've heard, uh, heard about all morning from this last block and the early block, which is if you look at what we've done really well with systems of care, we've integrated providers from all different professional backgrounds, we've shared data, to optimize our delivery of healthcare. That's really what trauma, STEMI, stroke, uh, RLS response, we're talking about need matched, time appropriate resource allocation. So if that's what EMS is doing, and I think we would all agree that's what we do, then we could apply that same principle to all kinds of healthcare problems. And that's really what the, the theme is here. Um, as promised, we'll start with the video. 
Hello, miss. I'm here with the ambulance. Did you call 911? Yes. It's about time you got here. My suitcase is over there by the stairs. You need to go up to my bedroom and shut off my TV so the plasma screen doesn't burn while I am in the hospital. Also, lock my doors and make sure my garage is locked. I don't want someone to steal my Hummer while I am in the ICU for several weeks. Hurry up, don't just stand there. You are wasting my tax dollars, you overpaid public servant. I'm sorry that it took three minutes for us to get here, but we are here now, so why don't you tell me what is going on with you today? Why do you need to go to the ER? Surely you aren't this stupid. What kind of paramedic are you? I am obviously horribly sick. Now hurry up and grab my bag so you can take me to St. Lawrence. I'm sorry, but you don't appear to be sick, and why do you need to go to St. Lawrence? Because I am terribly short of breath. I can't breathe. I woke up this morning and was not able to breathe, so I got up and went to Walmart and did some shopping for a while and realized I wasn't getting any better, so I went to the casino <laughs> and cashed my welfare check so I could gamble for several hours until I was almost out of money, and then I stopped at the gift shop for a pack of smokes and came home when I realized that I was still short of breath, so then I went to take some Xanax. But I ran out, so <laughs> then... Excuse me, could you stop talking long enough to actually be short of breath? As I was saying, before you interrupted me so rudely, I need to go to St. Lawrence as fast as possible. They stop serving lunch at 3, and if I miss lunch I will have to wait until 6 for dinner. Now hurry up douchebag. I don't have all day. Ma'am, have you been drinking? How dare you accuse me of drinking? Okay, maybe a little, but I'm not drunk. Okay, I'm drunk. But that doesn't mean I'm not critically ill. Okay, I really don't have time to stand here and listen to this. St. Lawrence is a very long way away. Do you have insurance? Yes, I have insurance. I have state Medicaid. Medicaid? Why are you on Medicaid? Because I am disabled, not that it's any of your business. I'm sorry to hear that. What is your disability? I have ADHD and fibromyalgia and I am a severe alcoholic. Do you have a job? <laughs> After all, none of those ailments should keep you from working. Of course not. What part of disabled didn't you get? My doctor has told me that it would be dangerous for me to work, even part-time. Besides, I have to stay home and care for my 11 disabled children. 11? <laughs> you have 11 disabled... Okay, we'll stop it there. Um, I, it gets really inappropriate really quickly, so we'll stop it there. Um, it is. You can uh, YouTube that. It's a uh, paramedic welfare abuser, I think is what they call it. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure we can find a way. But um, we know that, uh, that we do emergencies well. That's been our, our core business for a long time. Um, we know that the healthcare landscape is changing regardless of your politics um, and regardless of whether or not the Affordable Care Act completely evaporates. There are three principles that will likely remain regardless, and that's because these have really become the fundamental drivers of health care in our, in our system, and this even predates the Affordable Care Act. Improving the patient experience of care, which means the quality and the patient satisfaction, improving the health of a population, and reducing the per capita cost. That's called the triple aim. If you haven't heard about it, you should Google it. You should think about this language every time you talk to a stakeholder in your community, whether you're talking to your city council, whether you're talking to potential payers for services, whether you're talking to your hospital colleagues, this is a lens that anyone who's delivering health care is looking through. So we know that there's a shift towards outcomes, and uh, that triple aim aligns very well with an outcome-based uh, type model. So whether we're talking about fee-for-service, the world we live in today, where we get paid to, to transport patients, and we talk about the existing systems of care, you've heard all morning the key metric that people are looking at are outcomes. So I want you all to pause for a minute and, and rethink our fire service from a macro level, right? And what I see is that the fire service is perhaps the most successful public health intervention that's ever been delivered. So today, fires are a rare event and countless lives are saved as a result of prevention and emergency response. So think about stop, stop, drop, and roll, fire extinguisher, smoke detectors, fire code enforcement, et cetera. There's lots of other analogies, whether you do car seat installations, bike helmet programs, senior at risk, welfare checks, lots of other versions. 
but the fire service is perhaps one of the most successful public health interventions ever. So the challenge, we know that five to 10% of, of any urban population will access the 911 EMS system each year. There's studies that show anywhere between 25 and 60% of patients who make that, that contact don't require transportation. And I think those numbers are less important than the reality that there's a certain chunk of patients in all of our systems who don't need to go to the hospital. Having said that, I don't think that that's how we should think about the question. That's what makes sense to us all. That's what really drives a lot of, in particular, fire service-based interest in this topic. But that is not, that's not the whole picture. So I want you all to think about that. You all understand that, but let's try to move beyond that. You call, we haul, everybody gets that, that today we're paid for transport and that we're all hoping for a different model in the future. Many of you saw this uh, uh, paper that came out um, last February about how we're getting paid and incentivized to do the wrong thing. And so this perpetuates fraud and abuse. This creates perverse incentives for us to take patients to a hospital. It creates downstream costs that cost the entire system lots and lots of money, and it enables behavior that produces or supports challenging patients like we saw in the video clip in the beginning. We know that there's a lot of waste in the system, that our healthcare dollar doesn't go very far. Many of you probably saw the CMS uh, Department of Transportation draft white paper that came out July 15th. This is an evidence-based model that says we could potentially do better. Again, it focuses on a very specific piece of the big picture. And what they said here is, that, and I chose two of the four graphics from the, uh, from the paper as a, as a summary, they said that, that there's probably about 15% of patients who contact the system who could be alternatively navigated to a more appropriate place based on their acuity, and that if we could potentially do that as an EMS system, not just EMS, but that requires all the other stakeholders in an EMS system, like the people who are gonna get those patients, the urgent cares that don't have hours or capacity necessarily to absorb that kind of a patient, patient navigation strategy. If you could get everyone to do it, you could save up to um, $600 million for Medicare patients alone. So this is one example, it's a financial model. It gives us a sense that this really is something that probably needs to be explored. It's not the only thing though. So this is what the alignment looks like today, 911 first response EMS, uh, however, however you deliver that flavor. Sorry you can't read this box, but this says ED hospital, um, and this is uh, post-acute. So what if we reorganize the boxes and try to think about a way in which we aligned the system in a way that made sense? And notice that we still keep our core emergency response business, but there's an opportunity to sort of realign and integrate the other boxes. So I'm a, a, a public health lens looker, and so when I think about the core competencies of the fire service, prevention, emergency response, resource triage, resource coordination, system status man management, population health, mobility and transportation, community relations. These are things that the fire service does well in every community across our country. If that's the case, can we create a value proposition to all our stakeholders that includes better experience for, for our stakeholders, community engagement, improved health for the population, reduced, and preven reduced preventable and unfunded system utilization, potentially generate revenue for our system, reduce health care costs, improve the value for the health care dollar, and potentially create paths for non-promotional career advancement. So that's sort of like in an ideal world, that satisfies the value proposition for everyone who would be potentially interested in this. So what are the observations that we probably all share? There's is issues with current regulatory um, compliance. And so a lot of people talk about expanded scope of practice being required for us to do this. I'm not sure that that's, that's true. There's a lot of things we can all do. You heard about a bunch of it already, right? And I would say that Stroke systems of care, STEMI systems of care, trauma systems of care, system optimization, whether that's staffing patterns, whether that's uh, reducing our red light response, those are all examples of ways in which we can optimize our, our solution for a population. Reimbursement, obviously, does not align with a value-based model today, but there's a significant hope that it will. Flexibility, uh, it needs to be something that's 
adaptable for each community because what, what, what's needed in Chicago may not be what's needed in uh, rural, rural, rural Wichita, for example. Uh, it needs to be measurable, it needs to be scalable, reproducible, and it needs to be standardized, meaning that there needs to be something that looks recognizable in all these programs. So even if every program's different, every program's offering different services in a different way, there still needs to be some framework that makes it recognizable enough for people to pay for it. It needs to be patient-centered. EMS needs to be in a leadership role if we're going to um, play the role that we want to. It needs to support our traditional role, and it also needs to support an evolution. So this is a, a pretty typical logic model. Um, this follows a lot of public health kind of models, but community needs should define the input. So what's the structure of one of these programs going to look like? What are the outputs and what are the outcomes? Realize that no one can actually control outcomes directly. All you can do is develop processes and activities that are built upon resources and that are based upon an assessment of a population to influence an outcome. Outcomes are multi-factor, they're affected by multiple variables, and so we can't directly control an outcome. What we can do is we can, we can think about what the needs are to try to change that outcome, we can mobilize a, a set of resources around it, and then frame activity to do that. So uh, again, I want you to all sort of suspend your judgment for a moment, and I want you to pretend that EMS is not just about EMTs, paramedics, firefighters, first responders, law enforcement as we know them today, but to think about our core competencies in need-matched, time-appropriate resource allocation. And if we were to apply that to the, the chronic dysfunction and uncoordinated care in most of our communities, we could solve a lot of problems. And to do that, what we probably need to do is we need to leverage a team of resources. And rather than trying to sell to our stakeholders that EMS can do this alone with an expanded scope of practice, if we, if we take the approach that we can integrate with our colleagues and build a team, and EMS may be the right coordinator, right? So EMS responds and says, yep, this person doesn't need to go to the hospital. I'm not gonna manage this. I'm gonna pass them off to someone who has additional training, has expertise, we should never think that a community paramedic, for example, will ever have the expertise and skill set that a home health nurse does, that a pharmacist does, et cetera. We, I mean, it's, it's not possible, right? You can't replace four years of school with 200, 400, 800 hours of training for, for a paramedic. That's not to say that we don't play a central role, perhaps the key role in linking all of this together, in triaging these patients, in sorting them, potentially providing transportation when that's necessary. And what's really fascinating is that when you include all these partners, you change your value proposition because they all can get paid. And so when you partner with them, they're very interested in sharing, uh, sharing in that referral. So dimensions of performance around this, um, obviously follow the types of things that we all have heard about, the patient experience, what are the clinical outcomes, how do we demonstrate integration, how does this improve the provider experience? I mean, if you were the, the firefighter in that video clip in the beginning, you'd be very frustrated with your job. And I think we've all been there in some capacity, even if you're not a firefighter, if you're a, an ER doc. Um, these are the types of things that go into that provider experience. Value and then ultimately at the end of the day, the population outcome. So let me tell you a story about Chicago. In the 1980s, um, they took uh, members of some of our housing projects and trained them as EMTs and made them sort of auxiliary members of the Chicago Fire Department. They took an EMT basic, someone who hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the community paramedic movement, partly because the name's a bit off-putting to EMT basics. It also is off-putting to a variety of our colleagues who aren't EMS providers. And they paired the EMT basic with a public health nurse and they paired uh, the public health nurse with the pediatrician. What they said is, we're gonna send the EMT basic door to door in the housing projects and identify children who are either un or under immunized. They then passed them off to a public health nurse who gave them their shots. They found 1,000 children who were unimmunized in the projects. The public health nurse then passed them off to a pediatrician. This program lasted for about five years until the housing projects were demolished. It did a bunch of other things like uh, transport reduction. I can't tell you if this was safe, if it was effective, because that data wasn't being collected. The impetus of this program wasn't around that at the time. 
the data's there, you know, to, to fish out the outcomes now, uh, 15 years later would be a challenge. It was an incredibly successful program. It was published in pediatrics, and I'll be happy to share the article with you. But it's a great example how, of how EMS as a system can use its infrastructure and its providers without expanding any scope of practice to do something that is potentially valuable to a lot of people, a lot of stakeholders in the dialogue. So there's been several dialogues going on in Chicago now, uh, primarily with the mayor's office, um, our fire commissioner, um, members of our union, all see that, that this is a space that needs to be explored. Um, you know, the quote here is that uh, Mayor Emanuel, uh, this is from his, his innovations and policy chief, thinks that a mobile integrated healthcare approach, this is a way to integrate a variety of city services that are already sitting in our community that are being underutilized. Community paramedicine was born out of a rural setting, right, where there was resource limited uh, opportunity. In urban areas, we tend to be resource rich. The problem is that the patients are just as underserved as they are as in a rural setting, but the reason has to do with access, navigation, and coordination. So I think that mobile integrated healthcare as a concept provides a way to frame a dialogue within your community uh, with your stakeholders that can be potentially revenue generating. This has already launched a pilot in Chicago that is having uh, hospitals and home health pay EMS providers to do uh, CHF follow-up. Um, this is not a private EMS uh, type of an audience, so we're not going to focus on that pilot. What I'm saying is the same approach has created a really interesting dialogue at a city, city level, at the mayor's office level, around how can the fire department sponsor, lead, host, potentially coordinate a program within the city of Chicago. So I put this picture down here at the bottom because this is where we got our start, right? What's interesting is we worked very hard to liberate ourselves from that radio phone that required a mother may I system. We've gone so far that in many ways we've deintegrated ourselves from the healthcare system. And what we may find is that the solution isn't to create another provider with an advanced scope of practice and call it something that can be off-putting to a variety of our colleagues. The solution might actually be to say, let's all sit at the same table and think about how we can coordinate a solution as a team as an interprofessional team. You know what, EMS is then seen as a value-added player who's worth dollars. So with that, I'll pause, and um, uh, I think I went over by a couple of minutes, but I think it's a really important topic, and I would urge you all to uh, dive into the growing body of literature around mobile integrated healthcare. They are going to be paid for people coming to the hospital, but it's the issue of keeping them out and of not rebouncing back is, is the number one thing. And number two is that one of the things that we have an advantage on is that we, the paramedics are used to going into different um, you know, uh, projects, whatever as you want to say, or you know, a compartment complex where other people may not be comfortable. And in fact, I had uh, nurses at the table from the hospital saying, yeah, this would be a better system for us. So we have certain advantages where we can take advantage of this. And I like the idea of a career ladder that there's a place you can get to, and, um, and I think it's really kind of a good thing even from a union point of view. Yes? Are there any articles in particular that address the bomb insurance for your hospital providers and fire department aspect? Nah, not really. I don't think there's anything from the fire department aspect yet, and that's something we could consider because we're putting together our own project right now. That might be a good thing to write up about what we're doing and how we're doing it. And, um, and actually, a lot of our folks are like it. We're very fortunate because it's not just our city. We have a kind of a, I don't know what the word is, I guess, what do we call it, Ray? A federation of uh, about 20 cities, and they see how this is going to help each other out, uh, you know, in fact, in a mutual aid way, in a whole different way than we ever had before. We have one more question. You know, we're trying to get Ray up there. So I, I think the question is, um, 
budgets are getting cut, how are we doing this service? Is that the, the short version? Uh, so the answer is you can't do it for free, and I would encourage you not to do it for free. Um, that's a very delicate balance because when you have to demonstrate that you're capable of doing it and do a pilot, you have to do it with existing capacity, but as soon as you do something with existing capacity, they say, great, keep doing it with the resources you have for free. So you gotta be very careful about that, um, and that's why Pick a, pick a name that allows everybody to sit at a table, everybody gets to have a part of the dialogue and build the solution together. One of the key pieces of that solution should be how is this going to be financially sustainable? Meaning that you shouldn't base it on a grant, you shouldn't base it on, well, let's test it and see. There should be very transparent, upfront ideas about how it will be financially sustainable. So part of the, uh, the just to, this is gonna segue nicely into the next talk because Part of what we want to say is that there are players that continually keep coming back to the hospital, and that's what they don't want, and they're motivated. So if they can figure out a way to keep them from coming back to the hospital, and one of the things we've done is we've partnered not just with the hospitals, we've partnered with government. Uh, for example, in the case of what we call serial inebriates. Uh, several of you come from different places, such as San Diego, San Antonio, have had a significant experience in, uh, in this already. We're gonna tell you about some of the things we were doing in that area. Uh, I'll take that one question, and then we're gonna turn it over to Ray. Yeah, right, and a lot of it is sort of an abstract format, and so yeah, that'll be, yeah, it's hard to somebody do this, so that would be great. I think we can do that. Uh, Eric, you think you can set up your presentation so they can Absolutely. get maybe through Ray? Yeah, 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 yep. yep. that's right. Um, there is, I can tell you, last month, I think it was July's <laughs> issue of, uh, what's it called, EMS World or something like that. Uh, one of uh, Ray's protege is a guy named Jeff Beeson. He works out of Fort Worth. There's a, uh, their EMS system called MedStar, meaning the um, uh, ambulance transport program. And they've already done some cool things in this arena, and there's sort of a write-up about it. So that be, might be a nice thing to check out uh, you know, as you go through, and there may be some further discussions. Yes? Yeah, sure. Addressing, uh, uh, sir, the gentleman that brought up the question in the back about cost and how do you fund this. Um, we've had some interesting discussions in Albuquerque as we've tried to expand upon this, and I think um, what Dr. Beck has really hit upon in terms of the collaborative approach, but we have had um, uh, some healthcare entities that have said, if you can reduce our readmission rate by as little as 1%, 1%, we could fund your entire additional staffing. So for, for, you know, given where we are, additional resources to provide this because you need to make sure that you don't cut down on your frontline EMS emergency response because that is what we are set up to do. That is the primary effects and the primary focus of a emergency 911 response from a fire-based EMS and fire. But they could make a huge difference with new positions available to fund these home checks. Now, it takes a little bit of education, but there's money out there. You just have to explore it and find the resources. One of the suggestions we have of all the systems that have done this have been successful, they started off with either field training officers and or advanced practice paramedics and or supervisors, what you want to call them, and they would stop it on the diabetic who got low glucose, and then you said, oh, how are you doing today? So I guess we should take care of the hospital in case it gets low again. Instead, we say, okay, we'll come back and check on you in an hour. So actually, in some respects, what you've done, you put your unit back in service, it was just part of what they were doing mainstream, and now what's happened is there's an idea of morphing that further and getting funding from the hospital or finding ways to keep your uh, costs down. And Ray's gonna give you one way where we're gonna be, we, we've been able to do that in a good way, the crawl before your walk approach, and we're gonna start with the serial inebriant. So with that, Ray, would you take over? You bet, and this follows right on to uh, Eric's wonderful Set. talk. Um, regarding uh, a specific member of the healthcare family that we want to try to address. And what, I'm gonna be brief because I know I'm standing between y'all and lunch, so um, I'll try not to get into your lunch but just a minute or two. Uh, the scope of the problem is enormous. It's a continuing burden of services that certain patients use that is enormous and expensive. This ongoing massive use of emergency services is very real. And identifying these individuals, one place to look is in the number of, of public intoxication arrests. This is one guy with 259 arrests in two years, which means this guy lives drunk, stays drunk, and is being toted down to the, um, down to the pokey every two or three days. And if I may, and Ray, that affects the, the law enforcement system, it affects the, the court system. It affects the hospital system, EMS, et cetera, right? Well, just like you said, Paul, uh, police officer transport <laughs> costs. I mean, the cops got to take the guys down there. What does it cost in the city of Dallas 
per year to tote these guys down and sit with them for uh, to all the way through the magistrate. It's about a million dollars a year. I mean, for, that's actually hard person cost. For or, or? Uh, It's for two cops. Two guys. And so I want to give you an example of the kind of person we're talking about. One serial inebriate individual in Dallas in 2011. We responded to him 60 times uh, in 2011, of which we transported him uh, 38 times. Um, uh, total EMS responses were 60. Parkland got most of them. There were a lot of non-transports involved. You went with the cops a number of times. Here are some of the complaints of those, uh, of those times. This is that one guy. Back pain, aggravated assault. He's a professional street fighter, he says. Chest pain, ag assault, et cetera, et cetera. OD, lots of ODs. Um, here are his complaints. I shot too much heroin. See, there's, there's just enough and then there's too much. Uh, withdrawal, chest pain, <laughs> ankle injury, finger, and so forth. This is the guy's blood alcohol levels on presentation over the space of about a year. And this, this yes, that is 400 right there. And as you know, the legal limit is 0.08. So this guy is drunk, stays drunk, pounded drunk, as well as his positive cocaine here. Uh, he's a crack smoker as well. Tough guy. And uh, Parkland gets only about 11% of the transports of our system, and we know he's going all over town. So we don't, I mean, what the total charge is, who knows? What I will say to you is that he ran up uh, about a half million dollars in bills in one year alone, and, and he's been at this for years, all due to uncontrol uncontrollable inebriation on his part. Here is a, a busy slide I'm, I'm going to pull from this in which this is, the, the medic wrote this much. This guy, he, he, he pissed off the medic so bad. He, the guy says to the medic, just do your lowly job as ambulance driver and take me to the hospital before I have to do something to you. And started cussing me out, started hitting the back door until he busted out the window with his elbow. So this is this charming soul and additional burdens. These are EMS responses that might have been saving a life in the community. And the hundreds of ED beds being taken up per year by this guy amount to thousands of hours of ED occupancy by one person. The challenge is finding a more definitive intervention for the chronic inebriate while protecting our, our very valuable resources. So this is what we did. We've set up a serial inebriate uh, rehabilitation program in Dallas. These are the players. Melanie Lippman, um, formerly of Yale, now at UT, is heading it up. Uh, you know this fellow, Marshall Isaac, some of you know, formerly of San Francisco. And so the list goes. Uh, uh, that's the initial steering committee. This is our oversight group. It includes uh, the Dallas County Commissioner, the, uh, the judge, the director of criminal justice, the vice chairman of criminal justice, the PD, uh, and a representative uh, from psychiatry at uh, Parkland. And so this is, the first challenge is to set up some kind of way to find out who these people are that are placing the greatest burden on the community due to unrelenting abuse and de designing and implementing the system which would decrease the abuse of EMS and hospitals by these individuals. You start with law. It's illegal to be publicly drunk. People do it all the time, but it's illegal to be publicly drunk in most states, including the state of Texas. This is a key feature to the success of the SIP-type program in other states, such as in um, uh, San Diego. Uh, we, we're doing it through an IRB right now, uh, uh, granted by UT Southwestern and Parkland, that allows us to go into the charts and pull the data on these people to, to actually quantify the cost. Uh, Paul, you, don't, you haven't heard this. We recently got the cost from the Baylor, Baylor Healthcare System for the top 25 people that were arrested. It, it was two, two million a year. So enormous amounts of, uh, of cost. The available databases are then mined and cross-referenced to identify the serial inebriate behavior, which is EMS responses. We had that data in my office. Uh, this city detention center where they're taken when they're arrested, and under the IRB, the Par Parkland Hospital records. Uh, participating agencies were identified, which are Dallas County, the city of Dallas, UT Southwestern, the hospital district, the uh, uh, DFR, uh, the police department, and the bridge, which is the, the uh, homeless shelter operation. Initial funding sources with the staff support were identified. Paul played an integral role in getting initial funding support for that. Uh, expanded the searches to other hospitals as well, and that's that new data I just gave you. So we're keeping an eye on the, um, the detention center, and so, uh, and I'll, I'll show you the details. So this is two pages of the detention center arrests. So here's the pathway. They get picked up by the cops, taken to the detention center, and upon discharge, mandatory intervention by a motivational counselor to, to accept detox. It is voluntary at this point. Then transport directly to Homer Bound for medically supervised detox for up to a week. Establish primary care, psychiatry case manager, enroll them in North Star, which is basically our Medicaid for, um, uh, for psych, for mental health. And then we offer them transport to a traditional li transitional living facility for up to six months. Job training, case management, bank account, uh, transition to independent sober living that hopefully, as supervised by case management, will get these people stop them from killing themselves. They don't have to die. The problem is, unless compelled, so many of these will destroy themselves. 
You've got to get the right people from the beginning. And a, a great one to study is the one in San Antonio. They have a 67-acre campus. Uh, it's very well funded, and uh, it runs, it's a great one to go tour if you have interest in setting this kind of program up. You have to become the mental health authority, which means you are in charge of these patients. Emergency department leadership from the beginning, they have to get the funding stream arranged and get committed leadership, including from individuals recovering from their past illness. And one campus is preferred if possible. Other outstanding programs are San Antonio, San Diego, and Seattle as well. Uh, in conclusion, I, I want you to know that the first organizational meeting of a working group on sobering centers and serial inebriate programs will be held in Seattle uh, uh, together with ASAP uh, on October 15th at the American College of Emergency Physicians. Uh, Melanie Lippman will be uh, part of the group heading that up, and she can be contacted at melanie.lippman, two P's, two N's, at utsouthwestern.edu. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, I hope lunch is coming. Yeah. Commissioners really liked what I said about this because we clearly threw out the money thing, which is like, whoa, we're wasting all this police money, courts money, hospital money, and all that. But then what really sells it, especially those that they're worried about what the media is going to think about this, if they're being callous or whatever, because it's partisan. But, but he didn't point out the part about if you refuse, Test. you actually get into the legal system, is what happens as well. And uh, that's part of the program. Um, but one of the things you think about it, this guy has a bump on his head and he's been drunk, what happens when he comes to your emergency department? Oh, he's scanning. He's scanning. He's right? scanning him. So this guy's coming in once every two months, once a month, and then you could just see this pattern where they're increasing, increasing utilization, and next thing you know, they're in once a week, so they're getting scanned once a week, okay? And so they're past the, the lifetime, you know, safety uh, thing of radiation within about six months or something like that. Uh, if not sooner, they just says, so it's really, a, a, it's for their sake as well, we're trying to do this. Clearly they're getting in trouble, clearly they're beating up and all that. And not everybody will go for this, but if you get a significant number out of the program, if you get 900 people who cause 11,000 runs a year down to 700 people, you can actually make a difference, okay? Because remember those responses we see, 200,000 cases a year, in the ERs or in the EMS, it's not the 200,000 different people, so. Yes, go ahead. Well, that's what I sort of answered your question. I said, if we could just get that down from 900 to 700, we might make a difference. And so you crawl before you walk. We're getting to the point where we're starting getting our first data. Yes. Our direct contact with uh, both San Antonio and San Diego right. is that it's about 70% effective. There's about 30% that are just moribund and are exactly what you say. Right. Uh, in the San Diego program, there's splits very simply. You're either going to jail for progressive punishment, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180 days, uh, max six months per offense for being publicly drunk, or you're going to go live in this rehab program, uh, which we're gonna feed you, put you up, get you back into the job market, and there's only two rules. You gotta be here every night and you can't drink. Because if you do, you're gonna go to jail. And one of the ways we funded this was that we got the 1115 waiver came through. You wanna tell them a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it's, it's an experiment. And what, we, what ends up happening, of course, is under uh, the uh, Medicaid, Medicare services, there are, uh, there are grants available. So we've applied for, I think it's roughly, the, the total grant's about $15 million, of which we have to front several million up front, and which is gonna come from the county budget uh, to do that. And so that's in process for us right now. Are you guys working with, are you guys working with corrections and law on that? Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, one of the people, yeah, go ahead. Like you saw in North California, San Diego, they just released 10,000 uh, inmates. Somebody who's inebriated is working in Los Angeles, so they're back out. Even if they're chronic, you've got to deal with 50 calls for the city attorney's unit. If they're in a the car and it's not an orange user, yeah. they're out in 15 to 30 days, 30 days, they're right back on the street. And these guys, I've, I've been on 200 times in a year, and it's nonstop. You go to Skid Row, it's the same thing there. And like you put on there, it's voluntary to get into the system. Most of you are Oh, they're, they are absolutely into our program now. And uh, well, actually, from the beginning with Ron Stretcher has been terrific about that. He's the head of our, our court system. David, you want to say something before we split up? Yeah, I was, I was just going to add on the question earlier about uh, somebody said, you know, you have these sobering centers, and that's not the answer. And you're right, it's the first thing. And, and going back to the San Antonio uh, example, where they have a campus where there's, there are layers of this. So the guy comes intoxicated, he gets detoxified, and then they have ways of getting him into, the into uh, rehab. 
and they and there's ma several layers. And this is a whole there's a whole science to this. I and mean, these are people who are you know professionals at this. And how do you get these folks to turn their lives around so they don't wind up coming back out? And so you know in Houston we've got something like this where we've got a sobering center, and we fully recognize this is the first brick of the whole house that we have to build. So. You, know, you comment upon um, individuals, kind of the, the recalcitrant and uh, intoxicated person, if you will. Even if you're not successful in the long run, every time, whether it's three days or five days or seven days or 30 days, that you keep them off of the street and at least in an attempt at rehabilitation decreases the utilization. So it's, it's very small. They're baby steps. You have incremental improvements in it. And they might relapse, and that's to be expected. But you know, you don't know whether, as I tell residents when I'm working with them or paramedics um, that I'm training with and working with on the streets, you don't know if the first time, the, the fifth time, or the 50th time that you offer assistance to somebody, it's going to stick. But we're obligated, I think, moving forward to identify these individuals and attempt repeatedly, as the case may be, to try and get them assistance because you never know when that last time that you do it, it actually sticks and you make an improvement and you give yourself and the system a break and most importantly you give that individual kind of their life back and assistance and moving forward to maybe improve um, their outcomes and their health. Depends on the program and the model. It also, uh, it also. Uh, I, I could not quote you chapter and verse, but if you'll contact me through my website, I can turn you on to several uh, sources. Use an example for Albuquerque heading home, an initiative uh, in the metropolitan area in Albuquerque. A single individual, which was our 200th placement into our Albuquerque heading home initiative, um, the cost associated with his um, emergency response, transport, and ED visits, uh, when we calculated it out, so once we finally got him placed, um, would pay for his entire um, home and uh, assistance for 20 years, two zero years. Um, go ahead. That's a very good point. I mean, I, I think that the law enforcement element of this is, is only one aspect of it. And I can say just from personal experience and, you know, perhaps speaking to some of those cases that, that you were bringing up, sir, is that, is that uh, oftentimes, you know, we have to sort of stop uh, people's ability to continue making these bad decisions. And sometimes that works with the, our medical system in, in getting people conserved. Um, we've had some success with that. But again, that's, that is particularly in California, it, that takes, a, it's an extended, extended process. Uh, but in many ways, that's the only way we can really force people to get sometimes mental health care and substance abuse treatment. One, one of the difficulties with we said here, we focused on SIP, and we did it on purpose because it was just really easy to recognize for someone we're talking about, especially the politicians who are got very linear thinkers, et cetera, and they want to know, what are the media going to think? Well, you know, the way we sold this was to say, we're spending all this tax dollars, many, and yet the patients are being harmed, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, I guess we should do it. It makes it very politically acceptable. But the other thing is that we could see, when you start adding in this thing that it was drugs, and they're sort of like less political, whatever, and there's so much overlap in Venn diagrams here, and the mental health issues are so far, I mean, why do people drink in the first place? A lot of it, yeah, you could say it's genetic, but a large part of that is the mental health aspects that uh, has them do that. So it's a, it's a huge overlap. So, but this is kind of our crawl before we walk. The next thing is going to be we're going to be getting up on our knees here, and that's going to we're already getting the mental health people. So one of the neat things about the mobile integrated health care thing that he's talking about, let's say a classic thing is because sometimes uh, you won't have to worry about whether the patient has to go to the ER and getting paid for it because of Medicare and all that kind of thing because they're not necessarily funded by that, the mental health programs. So let's say a young woman, we go to her house and she acts out and says that she slashed her wrist. Well, with technology, as he was alluding to, like you have FaceTime, 
we can show it to the doc in the hospital or the psychiatrist say, what do you think? He says, okay, that's not gonna need to be repaired. She's had a tetanus shot recently. Okay, just bandage that up, clean it up a little bit, and then just take it right over to Green Oaks, which is the, you know, the, the whatever, you know, what's the, what do you call it, the metal facility directly, and just do that and bypass the emergency department and not have to cycle through the emergency department. So there are some things where we think that we can start more things slowly but surely along this. This was just a nice, clean place to start that everybody got everybody behind this, et cetera, and you can just easily add up the dollars and show the safety for the patient themselves, let alone, because um, we make it a safety issue for them versus like they got CHF and they keep bouncing back into the ER and you go, well, maybe they'll be better off in the ER. You know, that, this was kind of a, a one that helped us sell it first. That's why we started that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Because mental health just always kind of gets yeah, stuck agreed. over here. Well, our, we're motivated because in our emergency department, we've gone from 80,000 people in our emergency department a year to 140,000 a year in three years, and a large part of that is psychiatry patients. And uh, I haven't even told you about that because we offloaded, we used to offload 40,000 to urgent care, we're offloading 70,000 to urgent care. So we're talking about, we've gone from 230, from like 140,000 a year coming to our ER to about 230, it's the healthcare system. Also, we made it better, so when you build it, they come. And um, so, but we're overwhelmed on the mental health side. And so doing this kind of thing would be very helpful on that end to answer your question. Anybody, I think probably we should get going.